well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with us on the program today. We are going to be uh, highlighting some of the uh, media inanity taking place uh, regarding the uh, Second Amendment, uh, particularly what the Supreme Court might have to say next about the right to keep and bear arms. But before we do that, you know, in today's turbulent times, you need to gather tools that allow you to defend your family and your way of life. My friends over at Pickett's Mill Armory are the folks that can help you with that. Pickett's Mill Armory is a veteran-owned and operated rifle company in Georgia, and they're committed to providing you rifles with premium quality without the premium price tag. Their mission is to build you a rifle that gives you every advantage possible with 100% American-made components. So whether you need a tactical rifle or a hunting rifle, they've got your back. And you don't have to settle for just as good anymore because they've solved that problem for you. You no longer have to buy a rifle and then buy parts to swap out. When you purchase your rifles from PMArmory.com, they come out of the box with high-quality barrels, superior triggers, and other options that you can choose. When you think of Pickett's Mill Armory, think of small batch coffee. They're not going to compromise their standards to turn out thousands of rifles every month like a lot of other companies. Head over to PMArmory.com to find the tools you need to defend your family right now. That's pmarmory.com. Now, speaking of those tools that we need to defend ourselves, the uh, Supreme Court is going to get a lot of opportunities, frankly, to uh, hear any number of Second Amendment cases. But the Biden administration has formally petitioned the Supreme Court to take up the case of U.S. versus Rahimi. Now, this was a, a case recently decided by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, that found that the federal government's prohibition on firearms possession uh, for those subject to a a domestic violence restraining order uh, is unconstitutional. Not because the Fifth Circuit says, ah, domestic violence isn't any big deal, uh, but because they said that the current federal statute does not comport with the text history, and tradition of the Second Amendment that, uh, well, we'll get into what the court actually said and what the reasoning was, but we're also going to get into this uh, opinion piece at the New York Times. We're about to find out how far the Supreme Court will go to arm America. That's right. Uh, This piece written by uh, Linda Greenfield, who was the uh, paper's Supreme Court uh, Greenhouse, excuse me. Uh, she was the uh, Supreme Court reporter for the Washington or for the New York Times from uh, 1978 to uh, 2008. Uh, and again, like most of the uh, folks on staff at the time, someone who is firmly in favor of more gun control. Uh, as she writes, on March 17th, the Biden administration asked the justices to overturn an appeals court decision that can, in her words, charitably described as nuts and accurately as pernicious. The decision by a three-judge panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit invalidated a federal law that for almost 30 years has prohibited gun ownership by people who are subject to domestic violence restraining orders. The Fifth Circuit upheld the identical law less than three years ago, but that was before President Donald Trump, Greenhouse writes, put a Mississippi state court judge named Corey Wilson on the appeals court, noting that as a candidate for political office in 2015, Wilson said in an NRA questionnaire that he opposed both background checks on private gun sales and state licensing requirements for potential gun owners which indicates, again, a healthy respect for the Second Amendment, but really doesn't have any bearing on the Rahini case itself. As Greenhouse writes, though, uh, Wilson wrote in a decision handed down in March that the appeals court was forced to repudiate its own precedent by the logic of the Supreme Court's decision in the New York licensing case, Bruin. He was joined by another Trump judge, James Ho, and by Edith Jones, an appointee of President Ronald Reagan. Judge Jones, Greenhouse writes, has been one of the most aggressive conservatives on the country's most conservative appeals court. Oh, goodness gracious. And by the way, we've also seen um, Democrat-appointed judges uh, overturn gun control laws. We've also seen some Republican-appointed judges uphold gun control laws in the initial stages since Bruin. Um, uh, the uh, federal judge, Karen Embergut in uh, Oregon, who uh, said, I, I don't see any problem here with Measure 114 when uh, several county judges in the state said, oh, we've got big issues. So you can't always just look at who appointed uh, a a particular judge. I realize sometimes it is handy shorthand, and I do it myself. When we were looking at the Second Circuit three-judge panel that uh, recently heard five challenges to New York's carry laws, I I, I did look. And yeah, uh, I think two of the three were Democratic appointees. One was appointed by Judge H.W. Bush, 
uh, way back when, right? And yeah, you know, you look at that panel, you're thinking, mm, uh, this isn't good news for gun owners. Now, I will say, uh, we haven't seen the Second Circuit's decision in the uh, request for an injunction in these cases, but I was somewhat surprised by some of the questioning uh, from these Democrat appointed judges on the uh, Second Circuit Court of Appeals. I don't think we're going to, I still don't think we're going to get a hugely favorable ruling, but I could be surprised. And I do suspect that New York is not going to get its way in every one of these cases. Again, all of which is just a long way to say that uh, basing your uh, point of view, as Greenhouse does, um, almost solely on who appointed these judges. I, I, I Listen, it can be handy shorthand, but it is not necessarily indicative uh, of the outcome or why the Fifth Circuit reached the conclusion that it did. Greenhouse writes, 15 years after the Supreme Court's Heller decision interpreted the Second Amendment to convey an individual right to own a gun, there's no overstating the significance of the choice the court has now been asked to make. Heller was limited in scope, Greenhouse writes. It gave Americans a constitutional right to keep handguns at home for self-defense. It didn't give anybody anything. Uh, It uh, recognized the right that has been here all along. Uh, the court's decision, she writes, though, last June in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin was on the surface also quite limited, striking down a law that required a showing of special need in order to obtain an unrestricted license to carry a concealed gun outside the home. New York was one of only a half dozen states with such a requirement, as the court put it in the Bruin decision. Interesting to note, by the way, that uh, gun control activists can recognize, oh, okay, yeah, some of these gun laws are outliers when they want to. Right. When it suits their purpose. Otherwise, they're common sense, uh, longstanding. Right. Yeah, yeah. But as Greenhouse writes, what was not limited about the New York decision, indeed, what was radical, was the analysis that Justice Clarence Thomas employed in his opinion for the 6-3 majority. Following Heller, courts had evaluated gun restrictions by weighing the personal Second Amendment claim against the government's interest in particular regulation, a type of balancing test that has long been common in constitutional adjudication. The Bruin decision rejected that approach, instead placing history above all else. Well, not quite placing history above all else. The text of the Second Amendment actually is of the fundamental uh, fundamental importance, but you do have to look at the history and the tradition uh, of the right to keep and bear arms. As Justice Thomas put it in Bruin, this two-step process that courts had adopted post-Heller was one step too many. But I will disagree with Greenhouse when she says that uh, these courts uh, were simply following the Supreme Court's lead in Heller and McDonald because they weren't going back to the Heller case. Uh, Justice Thomas said in Bruin, the history text of tradition test has been the test all along. It's just that these lower courts decided to adopt another test instead post-Heller. And again, that interest, uh, interest balancing test that the courts have deployed far too often came out uh, in favor of the government's interest in promoting public safety at the expense of our individual rights, even when there was no evidence at all that these policies actually promoted public safety. You know, a a perfect case in point here, California's micro-stamping law, part of California's Unsafe Handgun Act. Now, um, a federal judge in California, Judge uh, Cormac Carney, recently threw out California's micro-stamping statute. The law was previously upheld, though, by the Ninth Circuit, which found that even though the law was impossible for gun makers to comply with, and the result was that there were no new models of semi-automatic firearms available for sale to Californians despite their commonality across most of the United States, that was okay. Because, according to the Ninth Circuit pre-Bruin, the government's interest in promoting public safety was more important than the fact that gun owners were not able to access commonly owned firearms because they still had access to some other guns. So the thumb was on the scale. And uh, again, the Ninth Circuit decided in favor of the state of California, pre-Bruin. Post-Bruin, Judge Carney says, listen, (laughs) first of all, the, the public safety argument doesn't apply, uh, but even if it did, where's the benefit here? You can't point to any real benefit, and you certainly can't point to any sort of historical laws 
or longstanding traditions that are even a remote analog. Remember, the Supreme Court didn't say that modern gun control regulations have to be an exact match to historic gun regulations, right? They talk about an analog. But the microstamping law put in place in California bears no resemblance to even the types of statues that the state of California were cited in, in, in its defense. Uh, barrel proofing, for example. As Judge Carney said, uh, the point behind barrel proofing was to ensure the, the gun wasn't going to blow up on you, right? Microstamping is supposedly a tool for law enforcement to use if a gun is used in a crime. So again, entirely different purpose, entirely different technology, entirely different mandate, and not an historic analog. So ultimately, the Rahini case, you know, Greenhouse says, well, listen, this is all about uh, domestic violence, uh, 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 individuals accused of domestic violence being able to own a gun. In Mr. Rahini's case, perhaps that is the specific issue. Uh, but as the Fifth Circuit opinion makes clear, what's really at stake here is, again, how we define the scope of the Second Amendment and the scope of the right to keep and bear arms. Uh, let's take a look at this uh, uh, from uh, the Fifth Circuit's opinion here. All right, so Judge Wilson says, according to the government, Heller and Bruin had a gloss on the Second Amendment that restricts its applicability to only law-abiding responsible citizens and ordinary law-abiding citizens. But as Judge Wilson wrote, because Rahimi is neither responsible nor law-abiding, as evidenced by his conduct and by the domestic violence restraining order issued against him, he falls outside of the uh, ambit of the Second Amendment. Therefore, are use the government... Uh, this section, 922 G8, is constitutional as applied to Rahimi. Because again, according to the government, the Second Amendment only applies to law-abiding individuals. The problem with that, as multiple courts have pointed out, not just the Fifth Circuit, is that there's no limiting principle to the government's argument. What makes you not law-abiding? Well, in the case of somebody like Mr. Rahini, maybe it's pretty easy, right? Not only was he accused of domestic violence, accused at this point but not convicted, but he had also been charged in a series of shootings in the Dallas area. Um, again, at this point, uh, I, I don't believe he was uh, convicted at that point. He had been charged. Um, Judge Wilson kind of explained this, saying, from the record before us, Rahimi did not fall into any of these categories. Uh, or any such group of, of prohibited persons at the time that he was charged with violating 922 G8. So the strong presumption that he remained among the people protected by the Second Amendment holds. Because when he was charged, Rahimi was subject to an agreed domestic violence restraining order that was entered to in a civil proceeding. Judge Wilson says that alone does not suffice to remove him from the political community within the amendment scope. And while he was suspected of other criminal conduct at the time, Rahimi was not a convicted felon or otherwise subject to other longstanding prohibition on the possession of firearms, that would have excluded him, uh, citing uh, uh, Heller, McDonald, and Bruin, um, showing that uh, support the criminals as a group, quote, fall outside of the people, uh, and that uh, 922 uh, G1 is well-rooted in the nation's history and tradition of firearms regulation. So this is an important case. I, I actually don't know if the court's going to take it up right now or if they will wait and see if a, a split develops in the circuit courts. But the issue here, again, is less about Mr. Rahimi, who, by all accounts, uh, appears to be a uh, not exactly the Second Amendment poster child that you want, right? But the question is really, who is protected by the Second Amendment? Now, we also have these questions about what is protected by the Second Amendment, right? Uh, gun control activists say, well, AR-15s aren't protected. Uh, large capacity magazines, however we arbitrarily define them, they're not protected by the Second Amendment. I, I think they're wrong about that. But we've talked about that before. Now, this is about who. Who is the people? Right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Does that apply only to those who've never gotten a traffic ticket? Uh, to those who've never been stopped for speeding? to those who have never been arrested but not convicted of a crime, um, to those who are, let's say, under a doctor's care for a mental health issue but have not been adjudicated as mentally defective. Again, according to the Biden administration, there really is no limiting principle, 
right? The Second Amendment applies to law-abiding citizens. And that means if you violate any law, no matter how minor, in theory, you could lose access to your right to keep and bear arms. So, I, I, listen, I have no idea what the Supreme Court is going to say here. I have no idea if they're going to buttress the uh, Fifth Circuit's decision, if they're going to let it stand without comment, if they're going to take up the case and overturn it. I don't know. We will see. But when Greenhouse suggests that um, we're about to find out how far the Supreme Court will go to arm America, the question really is, we're about to find out if the Supreme Court believes that the right to keep and bear arms, again, is a right of the people. Uh, or, again, if they will buy into the Biden administration's argument, there really is no limiting principle here that as soon as you violate any law, no matter how minor, you could forevermore lose your right to keep and bear arms. And while we can all agree that domestic abusers should face consequences for their actions, um, I think that you're going to find a great deal of legitimate disagreement between uh, those Americans who, again, believe that the Second Amendment protects a right of the people and those gun control activists who believe that any violation of the law, no matter how minor, could and perhaps should prohibit you from keeping and bearing arms forevermore. All right, let's turn our attention now to uh, today's Armed citizen story, our uh, good deed of the day and our recidivist report. We will start there with a case uh, out of Virginia, as a matter of fact, the uh, Shenandoah Valley. Uh, women plead to lesser charges in attempted robbery of Strasburg Hotel. Yeah, robbery, uh, uh, armed robbery, um, attempted armed robbery anyway. Uh, three Winchester area women accused of trying to rob this hotel back in February pleaded guilty on Monday to uh, those lesser charges. Crystal Lynn Falver, Tiffany Scott Leslie, and uh, Arthria Phillips appeared in the Shenandoah County General Court for uh, preliminary hearings. Each of them charged with felony attempted robbery by force. Uh, excuse me, I said armed robbery, so I guess this was not uh, armed robbery, but it was a felony attempted robbery by force as well as conspiracy to commit robbery. But each of the defendants were offered a uh, plea deal. Uh, and they were allowed to plead guilty to entering a building with the intent to cause damage and disorderly conduct, both misdemeanor charges. So the felony charges disappear. The misdemeanor charges are accepted instead. Uh, Judge Amy Tissinger accepted the pleas from each of the three women and sentenced each of them to 180 days in jail with 90 days suspended. So their six-month jail sentence cut in half down to 90 days. And then with credit for time served, the 90 days is going to look more like 45, so maybe six weeks in jail. Uh, also ordered to complete 12 months of unsupervised probation upon release from jail. Yeah. Um, according to police, uh, officers responded to the Ramada Inn in Strasburg back on February 7th for a report of a robbery. A uh, caller reported that three people had tried to rob the hotel by trying to force their way through an office door. Uh, police issued an alert for possible suspects in a vehicle. Uh, they uh, apparently arrived at the hotel in the same vehicle, but um, when two of the ladies could not enter the office, they returned to the vehicle. Then a the third person came out, went to the hotel office, posing as an Amazon delivery driver in an attempt to uh, gain access into the office. Yeah, all of them wearing uh, ski masks during the incident, um, supposedly to protect themselves from the wind, but whatever. Um, anyway, felonies reduced down to misdemeanor. Six-month jail sentence reduced down to three months, which is really going to be more like six weeks. And uh, problem resolved, <clears throat> supposedly. I hope that that all of these women get a chance to turn their life around. But uh, I'm not convinced that all three of them are going to take this opportunity to do so. Now, today's armed citizen story from Las Vegas, where police say an uh, armed bystander helped mall security deal with a uh, guy who was threatening them with a knife. Yeah. According to uh, Las Vegas officials, 22-year-old Latrell Calhoun is now facing several counts of assault with a deadly weapon. Uh, thankfully, not facing any murder charges. It was last Thursday, Las Vegas Metro Police responded to a call of the Fashion Show Mall for a report of a man threatening store employees with a knife. Security officials found the guy, later identified as a Calhoun, flashing a knife in another area of the mall, and they detained him while the uh, police officers were on the way. Officers described the uh, weapon as a large butcher knife. So while he's flashing the knife, officers said uh, Calhoun threatened to kill the security officers, actually lunging at three of them. That is when, apparently, a 
concealed carry holder who was there at the mall pulled out a firearm, pointed it at Calhoun. Uh, and according to police, that gave the security officers the opportunity to disarm Calhoun and place him in hand restraints. Calhoun also faces a charge of carrying a concealed weapon without a permit for uh, bringing the butcher knife along with him. Bail set at just $5,000, though, uh, on a uh, hearing on Sunday, uh, although he remained at the Clark County Detention Center as of Tuesday. Uh, again, the situation could have ended a lot worse were it not for the presence of that armed citizen able to uh, assist mall security and ultimately able to uh, aid police in taking the suspect into custody. So uh, job well done for that unidentified armed citizen. And finally, today in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Juan Andre Cabeza Mina, who was waiting for a bus along with his fellow classmates in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, this was, I believe, uh, last week. Waiting to, uh, you know, just start their school day. And all of a sudden, a car crashes right in front of the bus stop. And it's a power pole. And the power pole then starts swaying back and forth before crashing down. And that is when um, Juan Mina, again, acted with uh, heroism. Uh, saved his classmates, pushing them out of the way, getting pinned underneath himself. And actually spent two days in the hospital because of his injuries. But officers say that Juan rushed into the danger, moved his classmates out of the way before the pole fell on top of his legs. When firefighters arrived, bystanders already freed Juan from underneath the pole. But uh, again, he had to spend a couple of days in the hospital recovering. Tuesday was his first day back at school. And I got to share this picture. This is, uh, this is just great. Uh, according to Fox 8 in Charlotte, Juan was welcomed back to school by the student body, school staff, officers from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. Charlotte Fire Engine 42 and 65. It was presented with a certificate of appreciation by Fire Chief Reginald Johnson, who said, Juan is an example of service before self. Charlotte Fire and the entire community, thank you for your heroic actions to save your friends. Uh, meanwhile, Juan says, when I did that day, I didn't do it to be a hero. I did it out of my heart. He says, I don't remember what happened, but I will always have everyone in my heart. Well, you know, I mean, that's kind of the thing, right? Is that Heroism is not the absence of fear. Uh, it is acting despite your fear. Uh, and in this case, it sounds like one's instincts were to help those who were in danger. Uh, now, maybe he doesn't call that heroism, but uh, at the very least, it is a very, very good deed. And we thank him for it. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I uh, do appreciate you being a part of the program as always, and I'm looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. In the meantime, be sure to check out BearingArms.com. There is so much going on right now in the world of the Second Amendment. We've got you covered on the website uh, all day long, updating with the latest information that you need to know about. If you like what you see, I'd also encourage you to become a VIP member at uh, BarryAndArms.com. Just use the promo code GUNRIOTS and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. And as our way of saying thanks, we're going to give you exclusive content, new stories, analysis you won't find anywhere else because your support does matter and it really does make a difference. So thank you very much. Looking forward to being back with you again tomorrow. Right now I have to uh, go help my Amish neighbor recapture his dairy cows who have escaped into my yard. So I will see you tomorrow. Until then, be well. Be safe and be as free as the cows roaming my yard at this very second. All right, I got to go.